This presentation, I should stress, is actually very much a presentation of someone else's work, Thomas Rowe, um, who worked with me last summer and wrote the paper that I'm currently presenting, where we were interested in how people in the x risk community, from a variety of different perspectives and backgrounds, were making use of the available evidence in order to arrive at probabilistic claims. Um, and this seemed very important, um, but understudied given that people were coming from very different perspectives and the result using very different methods. So we start off with this rather lovely quote from Carl Sagan that when you're dealing with human extinction, it's a theory that you can only really test out once, if at all. Um, these are claims that we just can't aim at empirically verifying, or shouldn't aim to empirically verify anyway, in the way that we would normally like. Yet, we do want to make them. Now, in one sense, as I say, maybe you'd say, well, we don't, because the issue of human extinction is so important and so big that does it really matter if we're dealing with a 1% you know, probability or a 0.1% probability or a 0.001% probability? Um, so we think it does. Um, we don't think that you can get out, away without making these kind of claims, um, partly because even if experts don't always make you know, evidence based on probabilities, as Seth was saying earlier, nevertheless, if you cannot give probabilities and you cannot give facts and figures and statistics, there is an element in which you become discredited within the policy process. Um, and that's it's always tricky when you're when you're going into policy engagement to get that balance right between the need to appear authoritative and also the need to express your uncertainty, as climate scientists in particular, I think, struggle with. Another big issue that we have to face, though, is it's not just that we are interested in raising awareness and getting people to take seriously um, existential risks, but we also need to make some decisions about the relative likelihood of different existential risks and therefore that what we should prioritize our own work on. So one of the things that we started off looking at this is, yes, there are lots of different claims and lots of different methodologies, but there are also different contexts and purposes for which these claims are made. And three that seem particularly important is that claims are made for the purpose of actual prediction um, of the relative likelihood or relative probability of different outcomes. It's merely in order to prioritize which are more or less likely, or for purposes of coordination and communication between experts or between experts and the public. And these seem to us to present quite different challenges for justifying the use of probabilistic claims. So for predictions, for instance, where you want to calculate expected costs and benefits, you need to be pretty sure that you have expected probabilities that you can work with. Um, it, and that these are reasonably precise, or that if you're working with a range of probabilities, that you know at least the extent of that range so that you can calculate you know, the, 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 the likelihood of high impact, middle impact, and low impact outcomes and produce your expected results. If, however, you're prioritizing, it maybe is not so necessary for you to have so much information. What you need to know is, what are the relative probabilities of two outcomes and how much overlap is, in, is there between their ranges? And sometimes here you do seem to be dealing with order of magnitude differences um, or you know, you know that there aren't order of magnitude differences and the uncertainties are involved are so great that you can't make a relative prioritization. And you don't actually need to be able to put too exact a number on the probability associated with different outcomes. Finally, if all you're trying to do is to coordinate and communicate, sometimes um, it, you can be justified in doing things that in ordinary statistical purposes I think would be much less valid. So for instance, only wondering about what is the worst case scenario or indeed what is the best case scenario. And if the best case scenario is sufficiently bad or the worst case scenario is you know, sufficiently not bad or however you work it out, that can be sufficient for achieving your aims of um, communicating the nature of risks and coordinating efforts to mitigate them. And you don't even need to know necessarily um, how, how different risks stack up or, or, or so on. And I think a lot of the time when research is an existential risk um, 
are reaching for these kind of probabilistic claims, we do have this kind of coordination, coordination and communication in mind. We are writing funding applications. We are trying to justify, you know, technical um, researchers to take something seriously. We're trying to work out um, how we should think about the future and how likely it is, you know, for instance, that there will even be humans in a thousand years' time and so on. And these are actually much more of these third kinds of um, purposes for which we might use these claims. And that does um, impose less justificatory burdens, although there are definitely still burdens um, that we have to live up to. So the substance of um, the paper that Tom Throw wrote is actually a quite a lengthy literature review using um, papers derived from our new algorithm, xrisk.net, um, which you are all encouraged to have a look at, and in particular to grade papers for, as we're still teaching it how to do that well. But obviously that would be a bit long-winded to present to you here, um, as there are quite a few sources um, and quite some quite fine distinctions between them. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to um, go through quite quickly what the main methodologies that we came across in literature are and some of their advantages and disadvantages, much of which has already been talked about in the previous two talks, and then we'll finish up with uh, just some recommendations. So the first kind of methodology that people use is where you actually have historical data sets to work with. Um, and I know Seth was saying, well, usually this isn't the case in existential risk, um, for instance, with nuclear war, and that's true, but sometimes it is. Uh, we do, for instance, have a good geological record that we can make use of um, for estimating things like the historical frequency of supervolcanic eruptions, possibly also meteor strikes, um, and for certain events such as solar storms, which may pose an existential risk, we also have albeit a shorter but still relevant um, geological record to work with. Um, then there are cases in which we have, uh, we have historical data sets which we can use but which don't give us the full story, uh, so for instance with climate data. These are good because using frequentist statistical approaches you can produce objective probabilities. And whilst I think most people in this room are likely to be Bayesians, i.e. they are likely to accept the validity of working with subjective probability estimates, they're still often viewed suspiciously um, and given less credence than objective estimates. However, there are definitely problems here. Um, historical data sets will never get you the, what we might say, the final mile towards estimating human extinction. You can estimate from historical data sets how frequently supervolcanic eruptions occur, but you cannot estimate from them which type of eruption would cause human extinction. And of course, we are likely to be a very robust species. We have a very wide adaptive range. We can survive in a range of habitats, including space. Um, so it's very hard to estimate what's going to happen to us, even if we can estimate what's going to happen to the universe. Um, so usually you will find that no matter how objective you try and be and no matter how much you try and use frequentist approaches, you do end up making a good deal of subjective judgments, as Seth alluded to. Where you don't have such a complete historical record as that, you can still um, glean some interesting information from historical data via modeling where you can produce a model of an X-risk relevant system, a system on which we seem to rely and that might collapse in catastrophic ways, um, which models its behavior and what is likely to put it into what we could call a fail state or a state liable to call existen cause existential catastrophic risk. And there are kind of two ways that you can do this. So, Seth was talking earlier, and we've got this quote here from Barrett and Baum about their model for um, nuclear, nuclear wars, where you actually build a model specifically to look at the causes of nuclear war. You can also take existing models, and we had some very interesting conversations with IASA, the um, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, about the use of some of the large-scale economic and demographic models, agent models that have been produced of whole countries or regions or even the world at, at very good resolutions, and how we can use them um, to test out certain hypotheses about existential and global catastrophic risk. There are still lots of issues with this, and I think particularly with this second approach where you take models that aren't built specifically for existential risk analysis purposes. Um, one of the key ones being that you can calibrate your model using historical data, but because of the limitations of that historical data, 
you cannot actually calibrate your model's accuracy for talking about the sort of situations that interest you. So you're always left with this problem that you take a model and you say, this explains what we do know about, but what we don't know about, we know to be substantially different to what we do know about because it involves human extinction, which has never happened yet. Um, so what can we do here? And you know, there's um, various techniques, including um, the, the Bayesian analysis, where you take lots of different models and lots of different input variables, and you look at all the outputs, and then you say, well, you know, these are the outputs that seem worrying, and which are the models which produce these outputs that could also explain the past data, um, and others, you know, it, what, what fraction of models is that, and what fraction of outputs is that, and produce some useful results that way. But it's a long and complicated process, um, and it can't, you can't simply take you know, your nice model, plug in some figures, and get a neat answer out the end, which is going to satisfy everyone. But still, it's um, one promising way for moving from partial data sets to, um, to predictions. So those are the two ways in which we think we can use um, data in sort of more objective ways. But there are also lots of ways in which you can have subjective, subjective opinions. And these seem to be very common amongst people who try to make predictions about existential risk. You take an expert, you take somebody who should know what they're talking about, and you see um, what their opinion is having looked at the evidence. And this can occur in a variety of ways from individual pure guesses that you might use um, as a kind of starting point for then going on and producing, uh, you know, updates along Bayesian lines in line with new evidence. But you can also say, well, look, here's a process I went through, and here's all the data I considered, and here's the probabilities. Or we think um, a, a particularly fruitful method is this concept of the holistic risk assessment, where an individual does that for a wide variety of different outcomes, and based on the evidence, assigns probabilities for all of the a, a sort of exhaustive range of possible outcomes and make sure that those probabilities end up adding up to one so that you can cross-check that you're not, you're not exaggerating the risk of everything. Um, yeah, these, these figures are often quoted quite authoritatively because I think a number of reasons. Firstly, actually given the lack of evidence and the difficulty in producing reliable methodologies for producing claims, being able to say that, look, this really influential or really knowledgeable person, you know, this is what Stephen Hawking said, well, everyone would agree with that. It can actually be more reassuring than the best methodologies we have is simply this is an authoritative individual. The other reason I think these often get used is that they tend to be relatively precise um, you know, precisely stated relative to the outputs of other uh, methodologies because they only involve an individual's opinion. And whilst that's very troubling from an epistemic perspective because it hides um, information that we should have about the uncertainty and about the range of probabilities uh, within which an outcome would fall, it's also very satisfying, especially for policymakers and people who feel they want to know um, so this is something that you can draw on that's going to get good headlines. But it's also obviously quite a problematic um, way to proceed. One way of improving on the individual subjective opinion is to move to the collective opinions of groups of individuals. So you can simply aggregate expert opinions. You get a large group of individuals, often at a conference like this. Don't worry, we're not going to do it to you now. But it has been done in the past where you ask groups of people, what do you think, and you average them out. And there are two reasons, I think, in particular to think why this might be a good thing to do. Uh, the first relates to this idea of the Condorcet jury theorem. That is, if you think that every individual has access to a bit of information or a bit of a signal which is nudging them in the right direction, but for every individual there's also a significant amount of noise so that they will get it wrong quite often, but they're slightly more likely to get it right or they're moved slightly in the right direction, then if you add up the aggregate judgments of lots of people, you find that this amplifies the signal, neutralizes the noise, and produces something that's more likely to be a correct outcome. 
Now, in order to get this result, you have to, uh, several things have to be true. These are the conditions for the Condorcet Jury theorem, which have been around for a long time. Two particularly important ones is you have to think that there is some kind of signal that people are responding to, and they're not simply making up numbers off the top of their heads. And the other thing is that there is sufficient independence between judges, such that when you, in a sense, lay their judgments over one another, you, um, uh, you know, you're laying different, different data sheets, different interpretations of the signal. Um, if actually um, individuals are closely correlated or you know, their opinions depend strongly on each other, then you can end up amplifying the noise just as much as the signal, and actually the end result is none the better. Um, so there, as well as simply aggregating, there are a number of these structured elicitation processes which can work to, we think, do a better job um, at achieving these various goals. So the first two are methods that basically attempt to um, work out which opinions and which, which opinions we should pay most attention to. So the classical method or the classical approach is it's known to um, um, structured expert elicitation. You test experts' opinions against known matters, and based on how well they perform against these known matters, um, you then give equivalent weight to their opinions on unknown matters. So people who keep on getting it wrong, you assume that they're probably going to get more likely to get it wrong in the future. People who continue to get it right, you assume they're more likely to get it right in the future. The other um, it's very different methodologically, but achieves a similar result at the end of the day, is the um, a prediction markets, where you actually require people to bet real resources, or you know, at least resources that could potentially become real resources in the future, on outcomes. This requires them to take account of their own credence, their own level of belief in a particular opinion. Um, and then you can extract, rather than simply aggregating across getting the average opinion, you extract your end opinion from market prices, uh, which take into account, as I say, both the, um, what people's opinions are and how much they believe in themselves. These can definitely be useful, but on their own, they're not going to deal with the two issues which we think um, are likely to, to, to be problematic for aggregating expert opinion, i.e. the potential lack of signal and the potential presence of too much bias. The other two approaches that we discuss um, we think holds more prospect for this. So these are super forecasting, uh, which is an approach where you effectively uh, educate and encourage individuals to adopt better epistemic habits of reasoning, of setting um, evidence, of ex presenting all of their beliefs in ranges rather than point values, um, and uh, sharing and updating their beliefs and reasoning with others such that they end up producing better results. And this has been shown to be able to greatly increase individuals' accuracy at making predictions in the short to medium term, up to about 12 months. What is much less known is whether this is also of equivalent value um, for increasing individuals' predictive capacities in the future or indeed in relation to extreme unprecedented events. But it does seem likely that if people engage in these sort of activities, they will be better able to distinguish for themselves whether they actually have an evidential signal on which they can draw and also to recognize and compensate for their biases. The other approach deals not with trying to improve individuals, the individuals who make the opinion, but trying to use the group as a resource to produce better, more informed opinions at the end of the day. And this is based on the Delphi method, which is used here in Cambridge quite a lot, but for qualitative questions, where you basically have several rounds um, of expert elicitation, and in, in which individuals, um, usually anonymously, are able to propose what they think be that traditionally where the, what they're proposing is an area of concern or a topic of concern, or possibly also in rela relation to actually giving precise probabilities for a particular outcome. They also give their reasons and their methodology, including appeals to models, historical data, and all these other things, for having that probability, thus are able to justify it to other members of the group. And then they can vote on and revise those opinions as this multi-round, this multi-level process continues, um, thus basically using the the the, the wisdom of the, of the group itself as a tool for we're seeing where there are signals and where there is noise, and also for handling 
individual biases and correcting for them. This process or these processes haven't been used so much we find in the existential risk literature. Um, there's one example from the, the uh, 12 Global Challenges, Stuart Armstrong's paper, um, which did use something like a Delphi method, albeit to make more qualitative distinctions about which risk to take seriously. They are not without problems, as well as the possibility that as with um, any expert elicitation, sorry, any expert opinion, there is nothing there. There's also the issue that certainly within a political science context, deliberative um, epistemic procedures where people discuss their opinions have been shown to be able to produce more extreme opinions at the end than at the beginning and also often don't actually lead to any great consensus, both of which are seen as downsides. Um, although yeah, it, it, it kind of depends somewhat on, 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 on your, your um, opinions that, uh, that, you know, certainly in relation to existential risk, maybe we are drastically underestimating. But still, there were plenty of results from the empirical literature to suggest that these um, procedures can lead to what appear to be bad epistemic outcomes in terms of making people more extreme and or not resolving consensus, which may lead us to prefer other, um, other, other, other methodologies. Um, nevertheless, we think that this is an area where a lot more work could be done um, to see if better methodologies for um, combining expert opinions and being more discriminatory about which ones to, to trust and which ones to reject would be worth pursuing. So very briefly, we make four recommendations. Um, the first of these is that researchers should be very aware of the context within which claims are made and should resist attempts to move um, evidential claims that are appropriate for one context to another context because the epistemic justifications for those claims may not be suitable, even though we often face um, you know, a strong desire to make use of all of the evidence when we're making claims, um, this nevertheless may not be justified because those claims can actually refer to quite different things depending on the purpose for which they were produced. The second is that researchers should give more thought to um, the level and source of uncertainty um, in the claims that they produce, especially where individuals are producing claims on their own or you know, producing their own claims. Um, and perhaps that if there are claims floating out there where uncertainties have not been estimated, that it would be good for researchers to go through and try and make an objective external assessment of how much uncertainty relates to those claims. The third is that people should be willing to be more discriminating about the methodologies that they use. So far, um, the literature on considering methodologies for making existential probabilistic, probabilistic claims re relevant to existential risk discuss the advantages and disadvantages of different methodologies, but usually shy away from making judgments about their suitability or um, their, their, their relative suitability for different contexts. And we think actually there are reasons to think that some of these methodologies are simply better or more suitable for a certain context than others. And finally, as a, something of a rider on that, we think that more work should be done um, to produce structured expert elicitation procedures that will be suitable for making probabilistic claims um, in existential risk cases. Thank you very much.